All right, hi everyone. Welcome to our August meeting of the Underwater Homeowners Association. As you know, we've gone um, virtual because of this pandemic. And I, I hope um, my starting every single one of these sea level rise related meetings with a conversation about the pandemic we're enduring um, doesn't feel too weird. I actually insist on doing it because they're very connected to what's happening to us now. The way that we handle this pandemic and the problems that have been exposed in the way we deal with problems, the way we kick the can on the road, and especially how different populations are impacted differently um, is something that is gonna rear its ugly head uh, in Miami-Dade County, not just in future pandemics, but clearly in the issue we're trying to address, which at this moment in this particular underwater HOA meeting is a future of rising seas. And what this group of individuals is trying to do every time it meets, and again, forced to meet artificially here via Zoom, instead of as homeowners together in communion with one another, is to address that issue uh, decades. Uh, the issue in front of us today, and an issue that's gonna get worse and worse in the decades to come. I wanted to let you know that last time we met, which was July 1st, Miami had hit its 1,000 death. And those are the deaths that are documented through our Department of Health. And there's all sorts of issues about transparency and documentation uh, and process to that. But we will just take that as the number, the baseline number. Our first death uh, happened on March 26. So it took us from March 26 to July 1st to have 1,000 deaths. Today, today, that number is 1,775. So what it took us the entire, uh, the entire uh, pandemic to get to 1,000, we have achieved in a month, uh, you know, three-fourths of that in a month. And as you know, um, the virus is still here. We are not opening schools. We will stay uh, with this pandemic on the underwater HOA in a virtual way, and we'll continue moving forward. But the important part for us to understand is how government approached it, how polarization based on ideology exacerbated the problem, in fact, made a problem that really didn't have to be here, get here, how our lack of ability to prepare and plan ahead got us into a worse situation, and how even to this day, before I got on this call, I was listening to a press conference from the White House, we're still in utter denial. So the problem is real. When the pandemic is literally killing your citizens, imagine how we're going to respond with something that is four decades down the road and when some people think that they have a way out and others don't. That is why the work we do is so important. And I just wanted to put that in perspective. Today, as in every underwater HOA meeting, our uh, chair will take us through our invited speaker. And then he's gonna be leading us through uh, the back base study, which is how we begin today to plan. Well, one of the ways uh, today we begin to plan, work with the county and, and the, and, and the governmental agencies to plan for that future with sea level rise. So again, uh, thank you all for joining us. I specifically want to, uh, to thank both Adam Roberti, the director of Cortada Projects, the social practice platform where this is based, and Jamal Wilson, the uh, coordinator of this project through an internship he has with the Avis Center. He's a master's student there and he's uh, volunteering, well, interning uh, with us uh, 20 hours a week to bring underwater HLA to you. So this is a group effort. It's a communal effort. And uh, I so appreciate all of you being here. And with that, um, I don't think Brian House needs any introduction, but Brian House is the inaugural chair of the underwater HOA. And he uh, also serves as a, a professor at the University of Miami, uh, Rosa Steel School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences, um, and the uh, chair of the uh, Ocean Sciences Department, and also, of course, director of the Sustain Laboratory, where, among other things, they uh, learn about uh, well, uh, the impact of hurricanes on and their storm surge in our communities. But importantly, uh, how heat and uh, uh, how heat causes um, the kind of tropical storms and hurricanes. Um, and he can elaborate on that. I've just had the pleasure of being in his laboratory and working with him. So with that, I leave you with, uh, with Brian House, our chair. Brian. Uh, thank you, Xavier. And I, you know, I just want to uh, echo your thoughts on the, the importance of 
the, the illustration of the pandemic and the importance of how we need to change the way we approach problems, but you said it very well, so I don't need to reiterate that. Um, today we have um, Landolf Rod Barbiegos uh, joining us as a guest speaker. Uh, Landolf uh, is a Greek native who came to us by way of Lausanne in Switzerland and um, Princeton. And I don't know how many other stops, if those are the two main stops you made along the way, but those are the two I'm aware of. And he is a, an assistant professor in the civil engineering department at the University of Miami. Um, and he is a civil architecture and environmental engineering, it's the official name of the department. He's a structural engineer who is concerned with um, trying to work in particular on new solutions for sea level uh, shoreline protection and new solutions for building in coastal areas that allow us to have more uh, resilience to sea level rise and, and storm surges and such things. Uh, Landoff has been working with uh, me on some uh, interdisciplinary projects which involve living shorelines and coral reefs for uh, enhanced resilience um, from, from storm surges. And uh, he's gonna talk today about some of this work and. Um, and show uh, show some of the new solutions that are that the engineering community is trying to address. A it's a different era in engineering when you're attempting to apply this this kind of new paradigms. And I, I think Mandel's at the cutting edge of that, and we're lucky to have him here in Miami working on these problems. So let him take it away. Thank you, Brian. Thank you all. Thank you for having me. It's a great opportunity. I'm a, I'm a fan of your work and your group. Uh, I echo your uh, concerns and uh, words there. I think that uh, there's a lot to be said there between climate change and also uh, uh, the pandemic. There are some parallel uh, unfortunate uh, trends that we see, but uh, what can I say? I mean, uh, it is uh, definitely uh, an interesting time to, uh, to be uh, in science and uh, to be in the society. Now, uh, what Brian meant before is basically uh, I'm a student of his because uh, I was trained in uh, Switzerland, where is uh, basically we're talking about snow. And then I moved around, although I come from Greece, but uh, I never was taught about uh, hurricanes and things like that. But I had the chance to go through Sandy in New Jersey and uh, learn a lot about uh, uh, hurricanes in, uh, in, in a fast way, I would say. And since then, uh, I've tried to uh, tune my work a little bit towards that. So my work was primarily on lightweight structures, membranes, cables, and things like that. And we saw a general uh, interest towards applying that for uh, hurricanes and uh, storm surge and how we can use inflatable structures, temporary solutions, and things like that. Now, I prepared a couple of slides so I can walk you through the uh, um, through the uh, projects that I want to talk about. And I'll give you an overview of uh, what I have there. So I don't know if uh, you can see my screen right now. Maybe not. Yeah, we can. All right. So let's go. All right. So I'm going to talk about basically three research projects that relate on coastal protection. And I wanted to start like, uh, I really like this uh, slide where I, Founded like uh, I think uh, a couple of years ago, and it talks about sustainability, which was like a big uh, word and a big trend uh, some time ago, and still is. But if you see there on the left side, we talk about uh, demographic, socioculture, but on the bottom, it has epidemics, and I never made, paid that attention until today, when we are actually talking about this, and it's very relevant. So we're talking about the indirect drivers and direct drivers, and how this affects where we're going today. The other thing in order to provide some context is how we have more and more disasters that affect, uh, let's say our region. And by that, I mean the United States in the sense that uh, we see that the cost of those disasters increases. And it's not only the frequency, but it's also their uh, effect that is uh, the magnitude and effect, uh, both in terms of economical, but also in terms of social and they're linked, of course. Now, what I do is called structural morphology. There's a, uh, an acronym for that because uh, it is inspired from the uh, biology. And uh, here, structural morphology for me and uh, 
let's say some of my peers, it, it's the relation between uh, the structure, the form, the material, the forces that developed and how everything is tied together or should be tied together. So again, like this is, comes from biology. If you are uh, into biology, you probably know the word morphology from Greek, how the uh, shape and structure, pollen and pattern in organisms is composed and how you can use that into a design thinking is about the morphogenesis, the genesis of the morph which is basically uh, the shape in a general way. So let's go into the back base study. The back base study, when it was conducted, I mean, when it was studied, it gave us a nice broad range of solutions, starting from nature-based solutions to uh, solutions that are basically inland, and we're talking about basically relocation of our structures. So we're going from uh, deep in the water, I would say, all the, way, all the way to the shore, to the structures that are affected. And I think that's the way we should deal with it because there's not one solution that fits all. So we have to take measures at all steps. So I'll walk you through basically three projects that I've worked uh, and I'm currently working on that showcase how these things are complementary, but how also we have to think about different approaches in all three of them. So the first one is about nature-based solutions. And uh, Brian actually pointed regarding the, uh, our work on the coral reefs. And it's, it's uh, currently accepted that uh, our ecosystems out there actually protects us and protects us by a lot. So for us, it's the coral reef, it's the mangroves. Uh, we love them or we hate them. I don't know, some people uh, really don't like mangroves because they cut the view. But if you think about the benefits, they're enormous. Same thing for coral reefs, which we don't necessarily see unless we actually dive. But uh, people have estimated actually the, uh, their uh, protection and it's about 675 million per year, which is uh, an enormous amount of money if you think about the uh, investments that we're about to make with the back base study. Now, the value of our reefs can actually go to 7.9 billion during a severe event. And this is very important because then we can think about how these events are affecting our region. Now, the coral reefs act as natural submerged breakwaters. They basically dissipate the impact of the waves and the impact of the waves is in, in very important. We have a rule of thumb that uh, a repeated action of waves of approximately three feet can uh, uh, destroy a small house but uh, they also indirectly affect flooding and erosion. So these are important effects. Now, what is real the problem with nature-based solutions? We know they're effective, but the problem is they are, uh, their effectiveness depends both on the environmental and physical parameters. This is why I think they're not considered in a lot of those studies, because when you make an investment and you have to actually say something, and this is maybe my civil engineering approach, you have a liability with respect to the product that you're signing off. And we cannot actually guarantee the performance because their performance fluctuates on the environmental parameters. And this is something important that we need to understand, but that does not mean we should not use them. It's just that we need to know that at an, after a certain level of, uh, let's say waves, we're gonna lose that efficiency. It's not the same as putting a huge wall, of course, but what is better, a huge wall or a coral reef? Now, what we're trying to do is uh, following the solution-based thinking, and we're trying to design hospital structures that are artificial coral reefs. So we have a structure which is basically man-made or human-made, and uh, uh, dissipates in conjunction with the uh, uh, corals that are populated upon it and we're trying to quantify what would be the effect at different conditions and for that we're using basically uh, the sustained facility so Brian uh, is uh, the director there and it's a great facility so I had this my these are my regular uh, uh, slides that I steal from Brian every time I do a talk about it so it's a wind wave tank it generates uh, hurricane conditions in the sense that we can uh, combine wind and waves so we have a scale model and we try to evaluate this. This is a small video from the sustained tank. So there you can see some waves that are combined with the wind. So what we did is we uh, create a model and we use actual uh, coral skeletons 
And what we're trying to evaluate is what is the effect of those corals when we try when we test our model with and without them on top. We're doing typical measurements of uh, uh, water level and uh, there is some analysis there. But basically what we're trying to capture is what is that effect, the added effect of having the corals there. This is very important because we need to know and quantify that under different conditions in order to inform how this can be used in the future. So this is uh, actually a small video of a very low, uh, uh, very low depth. So you can see the corals almost uh, sticking out, which happens in some regions of the world, but not in our region. So clearly we see an effect. We see that the corals do help. And we also see that it fluctuates by a lot. It can vary from 10 all the way to 55% based on the test that we did. So 10% and 55%, these are enormous values if you think about it. So these are some kind of uh, analysis that we've done and we have different cases and we use those parameters to understand the, uh, the energy, how it dissipates over the coral reef. So here you see, have a profile of the energy and how it dissipates. And this is on a specific condition, but this is kind of what we're trying to understand those mechanisms so that we can use them. When you use a real organism though, you, you have also to evaluate how they behave. So an interesting problem for me is that we're building a structure that the corals must feel good to live on. And the corals are a living organism and they cannot express what they like and what they don't like. And I'm surprised to hear a lot of things and learning a lot of things from our biologists because uh, I mean, I, I learned that uh, corals like certain colors and they might like uh, shade or uh, certain temperatures and not others. So it's a very interesting problem. But for me, who, who, was, who I was trained that uh, to have some design guidelines, it's an interesting challenge to not being able to figure out what are those design guidelines and trying to experiment. So what we are doing here also, our collaborators, they are doing tests. So we, uh, uh, they put some uh, small corals uh, in different locations along Miami Beach to see the mo their mortality rate, to see how fast they grow. And in here in this figure, you can clearly identify that the closest we are to the port, the worse it becomes. Now, we are also working uh, with the city of Miami Beach. We're trying to implement a, a field study because uh, the laboratory setting is great. We can regulate our conditions and do a lot of testing and understand. But uh, we have to combine this with our, our real, uh, let's say, uh, field studies, which will provide us a lot of uh, knowledge. It's also scaling up, which is an important parameter on these studies. So we're currently in the process of permitting. We have some uh, legal... Uh, let's say dialogues with the cities regarding some components, but we hope that we might be able to put some structures out there, monitor the growth of the corals, as well as their effect on the waves. Now, this is at the uh, level of the, uh, uh, of the sea, but then if you go a little bit towards, uh, um, towards the shore, but before you reach actual the structures, we can talk about seawalls. Seawalls actually are a very, uh, common structure that we employ, especially in, in areas where we cannot really uh, have a lot of, uh, I would say, um, use a lot of distance, and especially for high value uh, uh, areas. So high value, high value areas, I mean, you can think about also what uh, the Back Bay study proposed with respect to uh, downtown Miami. Now, the uh, seawall at Brico. Now, what we know about our seawalls is that they're not often uh, performing as well as we are thought. And also, they're not really eco-friendly. So there's a recent study by the Center for, Climate of Integrity, Center for Climate Integrity, CCI, CCI. And they basically said that uh, the next 20 years, the cost of basic construction Yes, Ellie. It's okay. Sorry about that. It was a thunder. So uh, the uh, the CCI said 
basically that in the next 20 years, we're going to need 76 billions in terms of uh, cost in Florida. And Miami-Dade, just for seawalls expenses, is going to need more than 3 billion. This is enormous number. And we know also that seawalls are really not uh, eco-friendly. So there have been studies out there that they show 23% uh, lower biodiversity, 45% fewer organisms. So we have to actually uh, address those issues because if we have alternatives that are more eco-friendly or uh, if we can use other, uh, uh, let's say, solutions, they might provide similar, uh, let's say, uh, protection. So in our case, we are going with, uh, again, uh, a proposal for uh, a kind of hybrid structure. We call it C-Hive. It's an efficient and cost-effective solar and protection system. It's modular. You can see here uh, some uh, synthesis images. So uh, it's basically uh, uh, modular tubes uh, and uh, they are perforated so the water can go in. And we have an expert in the call who can take, take, talk to you about that, uh, who has been working on this for uh, quite some time now. And uh, we tested uh, basically three different shapes. Uh, our favorite is the uh, hexagon, because the hexagon allows you to create a tessellation without any gaps. And it gives you the most volume for a given material uh, uh, value. So basically, that's why the beehives are also hexagonal structures. So it, towards the idea of sustainability. Now, this is modular, so we can use it uh, uh, in, uh, in multiple ways. We can create different slopes. Uh, we can uh, uh, tune the perforations to fit the uh, conditions. So if we have something that is going to be a uh, high tidal region, then we can actually create the perforations that will dissipate progressively, or we can leave it open. The perforations will allow also the water to go in and we will have sedimentation. So there is a lot of interest there. Uh, it's cost effective because this is something that we have been using uh, for quite some time now in terms of production. And we believe that it's going to be eco-friendly if we use it correctly and we apply the right materials. So here we're going with seawater concrete. So we minimize the, the interaction between seawater and concrete. And we also want to apply non-corrosive rebars, so we don't have basically corrosion, which is a big problem when you're talking about not only for the structure, but also for its, uh, uh, its biocompatibility. So what we're doing again in SUSTAIN, we're trying to use the laboratory as much to get the understanding of uh, how these uh, uh, structures will perform, both in terms of the forces, but also in terms of their performance with respect to the wave energy that they absorb. So we've been testing those, and this is actually the testing that we are currently preparing. So we are uh, currently setting up our uh, big model in the tank. So here's an older picture. Uh, so we are trying to put this and make the measurements. So it's gonna be perforated and make different measurements so we can actually uh, use it in the field. We were lucky to collaborate with a community that is also very, uh, uh, interested and uh, and uh, is looking for projects. So uh, in that uh, community, we're going to use Seahive, and uh, we are going to use Seahive with a material that we identify as more eco-friendly. So we did some auxiliary biocompatibility studies. So the uh, the main author of this study is also here on the call. So if you have questions, I'm sure he will be happy to. Uh, Answer. So what we did, we applied different uh, mixes of uh, cement to see uh, under the same conditions, which one actually was more, uh, let's say, biocompatible in the sense of absorbing more materials and allowing the development of organisms on it. So combining all this, we're going to use that in uh, North Bay Village. We got a small, uh, uh, almost uh, 10 feet section of a seawall where we're going to use our elements to replace the regular reprap. So in terms of that, uh, uh, reprap has no specific environmental conditions. It's just basically boulders that we employ. Uh, but uh, we think that we might be better performing and more eco-friendly than the traditional uh, reprap. Now, if we go inside, we go to the structures. On the left side, you see uh, a pamphlet that we developed with Sonia Chow. I think she was... Uh, 
uh, here, uh, I mean, she gave the previous, uh, she was here at the previous meeting and gave some, uh, uh, gave a talk. I don't know if she talked about the pamphlet itself, but we have been working with the School of Architecture on developing those pamphlets, how a homeowner should address uh, adaptation. And uh, this, on to, this is to avoid basically the damages that you see on the right side. These are actually my pictures taken off from the reconnaissance survey after Irma in the Keys on the top. And this is the bottom is on the Bahamas after Dorian. So one is storm surge, what you see, and the other one is wind. So uh, you can imagine the level of forces that we have. Of course, the type of construction, the materials you use, they have also a big effect. A key point here is that if you take a close look on the picture on the uh, bottom right, you will see that this is actually still habitable. The person who is living there is still occupying that building. And this is because they don't have, another, they don't have other means. These people have to live somewhere and they still live on that house. So combining resilience and affordable housing is a big issue. And it's also a big issue in Miami. So I, I've, it's an issue that I've been working with the Office of uh, Civic and Community Engagement in a project that they have uh, sponsored by JP Morgan. And there we, they have this tool, the uh, Miami Affordability Project is a mapping tool where they have all the different uh, affordable houses. So different types of affordable houses. Uh, it could be uh, the assisted or the public or the NOAA one. And then uh, we are trying to see how different, uh, let's say uh, affordable houses can be adapted and what should be the way to adapt them. So, we're trying to introduce some considerations of resilience into their tools. So what we did is we mapped basically the, uh, the different uh, houses that they already have, and we addressed what is their building typology. So we did that per region also, because we know that Miami is quite diverse. We saw that a lot of them are basically garden style and uh, mid rise buildings and high rise are the second, uh, let's say most popular. And then, we had to address the flood risk. So here you can see basically the uh, flood zones that are for the city of Miami. Actually today I heard that the, uh, the, the revised, the preliminary version of the revised flood maps should be available sometime in October. I don't know if that will be the case, but we, I know that we have been waiting for them for quite a long time. Now, we know in Miami that even if we know the flood zones, it's not, Miami is quite, uh, uh, unique in the sense that we have uh, uh, a topography that variates a lot and based on your backgrounds I can also see that for uh, for your community but uh, what we did we went a little bit more granular in the sense that uh, they mapped also the elevation so in the new version of the map they work with our center of computational studies and uh, they map the elevation. So you can see the different layers that we're gonna have. So ground elevation is gonna appear and they also project, they use the projection for sea level rise. And there are projections also for storm surge that can be uh, uh, tied to that uh, tool. So you can see who is gonna be affecting and by how much. Now, with respect to that, we did also some case studies. So we took different neighborhoods and different typologies of affordable housing. And we went a little bit more granular in the sense that uh, we took data for specific structures in order to, uh, to really see what matters when you adapt them. And uh, I'm not gonna tell you which structures because uh, this was is kind of a privacy issue, but uh, I'm gonna present you an example. So what we did is basically a cost base, a cost benefit analysis. And we treated it based on building typology and we wanted to see how each uh, uh, adaptation strategy affects it. So for the cost estimates, which is also a big uh, discussion there with respect to the back pay study, uh, I, I was uh, uh, responsible for that. So I used the, uh, the costs that were related in the literature, scientific literature, peer reviewed, and I adapted that. And this is per building and uh, different, uh, let's say, flood depths protections. Uh, we uh, updated that using the consumer price index, but I also ponderated with the size and uncertainty factor. And that was an important part because uh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain you at the end, our results are quite similar to what we get from the back bay study if we go down to their criteria. Now for the benefits, we have uh, basically physical benefits. That is basically the, uh, the uh, 
uh, damages that are avoided. So damage, we use damage functions. These are available and they tell you with respect to the uh, level of flooding you have, what will be the percentage of the damage in terms of the uh, replacement value of uh, the building and its content. But we also had other components there, such as displacement, mental stress, and loss of productivity, which if you consider all of them, this explodes basically uh, the, uh, the calculation. So in order to select the strategy, we had to go and see the structure itself. So you have to evaluate what is the structure type, so we had to make some assumptions, unless if we go and uh, visit the structure, make an assessment. So we consider each structure to be a prototype. So this really requires uh, an, a, a clear assessment and visit of the structure. Then we took the number of stories, building footprint, flood protection depth, if it's going to be, uh, uh, or, uh, if it's protected. So if it's on the flood way, what would be the flood velocity? There's a lot of granular details that are very important but we had to simplify that in order to make a, a large scale, let's say, analysis. So here's a, a, uh, just an example to give you uh, an idea of this type of studies. So this is a garden style in Overtown, uh, total area 34,000 square feet. Uh, we have three floors there. It's basically in the uh, AE zone. So it has a first floor elevation of nine feet. This is very important because the first floor is something that is very important if you want to evaluate what will be the impact of the flooding and the ground elevation of approximately eight feet. So we have a projection of uh, there for sea level rise and storm surge for the 100 year storm and 500 year storm, which gave us a flood depth. So this is a basically a ratio of three feet for the 100 years storm and four feet for the 500 year storm. So the solutions there basically are dry proofing, wet proofing, and uh, wet proofing you can do for the 100 or 500 year. Here, elevation is not applicable because this is a three floor structure, unless if you consider building upon. So we have the building market, we have the building content replacement value. So we estimated what would be uh, a range of uh, cost for the different solutions. You see that the range is quite the cost is quite low, which is a good sign. And then we did the estimation of the benefits. So in terms of the physical and in terms of the uh, full analysis, what are the benefits considering also the other uh, components? So this is the benefit distribution. You can see the building uh, damages, content damages and their respective ratio with respect to how they affect. Now, with respect to the cost estimates, we see that they are only a fraction of the building value. And when we go to the CBR ratios, basically we see that these are very high, almost enormous high, considering even the conservative, which is just the structural one. There, we have to be careful because a cost model is, again, like this is a theoretical model. We have to clearly understand what are the, uh, the effects there. But uh, doing this exercise with respect to different typologies all around the uh, Miami Dade, we were able to see some trends that I clearly can tell you affect also the back bay study. So when the damages are a percentage of the replacement value, when you do that with respect to uh, a small structure like this, a garden style, and you do the same analysis with the corresponding, uh, let's say, damage functions for a high rise, of course, the high rise is going to give you a huge CBR ratio compared to the small structure. So the social component there is not really, uh, let's say, captured by those uh, let's, uh, damage functions. And this is something very interesting in social scientists that have been working on adaptation and uh, have been working on uh, uh, these issues actually uh, uh, do know about this, that we should not be driven just by the uh, value and the return of the investment that we get. So a couple of acknowledgements, some of the people are in this call and some of uh, the people that could not be here, but uh, I know they're all uh, supportive of these kind of initiatives and uh, the work that you're doing as a community. And uh, these are also some of our funders there and collaborators, collaborators from the different cities and different organizations. So I'll be happy to discuss with you and uh, we can try to link that to any discussion that uh, this uh, may lead. Thank you, Landolf. Uh, extremely interesting. And every time I or hear you talk, I learn about some new activities that, that you have going. So it's 
So it's certainly interesting for me to hear, and I'm, of course, probably, I'm sure that for those of you, that, those on the call that weren't as familiar with the things you're doing, that that was quite interesting. So I'd like to open it up now for anybody has any questions that they would uh, like to ask Land up so we could uh, to follow up on any of these subjects that we approached here today. I guess you can just, um, I don't know, technically, do you just physically raise your hand, we're small enough, or send a request and, or just, again, are we all able to unmute ourselves and do it? It's a small enough group, we can do this pretty informally, I think. Yeah, I think we, we, we unmute when we ask and then we remute just so that we don't get a lot of uh, feedback. So that's probably a great way to proceed. I, uh, I have a question. Go ahead, go ahead, Jamal. Um, so I, I just thought of um, how an increase in demand for adaptation services, like specifically the examples you gave uh, for the, um, the, the five unit structure at $485,000 value, how the, how the increase in, in, in demand would impact the cost of those of those services. Like if if a large scale kind of wave of understanding came, and people were like, "Okay, we need to do this." I think it will have an effect. But the other thing that we have to think is that this is also very uh, unique because you're adapting some. Of of course, the more we have like a competition in the prices, this will bring it down, and we will have an effect. But the other point that I want to make is that. Each structure for us is unique. So how you actually access the site, what uh, typical reinforcement the structure might need in order to uh, be dry proofed or uh, if you wanna elevate it. So the issues that you're gonna discover that you never thought about. So all these are quite unique. So it's the cost models there are really, I would say uh, uh, not completely reliable. And if you see the back bay study, you see that those kind of calculations are not in the uh, released version. I had the chance to discuss, however, with uh, Miami Dade uh, Resilience Office, and they uh, uh, they actually uh, told me a couple of numbers that uh, they received, and then I checked with what we have, and we were not that far. So I can tell you that although they do like a a very, I would say, a bird's eye view analysis because they cannot go and do that for the buildings. The numbers that they get, and of course, when you project to do like a big uh, intervention like they do, the numbers that they got, they're not that off. Of course, like this is how you select those buildings that you wanna, I mean, and where are those buildings? That is gonna be right. also a big uh, point of discussion there. Hi, it's Xavier here. So I think a lot of a lot of decisions um, have, you know, multiple variables, visual parameters that come in. For one, who is the decision maker, and what is the decision maker responding to? And a lot of that depends on time. Um, the mayor of North Bay Village, I actually interviewed for the Miami Corona Project just uh, two days ago, and may be online already. In that conversation with this young progressive mayor. I was not there to talk about sea level rise, but he brought it up and he made the comparison between the two. He understands he's a half a mile surface area. The densest population in the country is in that little two island area. And he sees the value, but his residents don't. He, is, he sees the value and he's taking leadership or trying to, to address sea level rise because he's at sea level and he understands that he's in trouble, that his community is in trouble. But he's not gonna get rewarded for anything he does with you or with anyone else in the next selection cycle two years from now or four years from now. So that's one consideration, like where does leadership come from and how does, how does one act? The second, I think, is also the timeline of the person who has to invest in, in prepping and protecting their home. If you are a slumlord and you have a building, you are praying for a hurricane to get rid of that building for insurance to wipe it out and for you to build a 22-story building on that site and you out of your own pocket don't have any incentive whatsoever to do anything with that building so it's who's a decision maker in this case it's government saying do we spend billions on a wall or do we spread billions across a community-based program to protect these things and again how are those decisions made well it depends in a world where you get elected by contractors and developers 
mm, they probably would be okay with the latter, the one that helps a broader community. Or if it's one builder and one developer, well, maybe he wants to build your wall. So these are all considerations that are you know, concrete in the political world that, that help us address that. And of course, the other, <clears throat> the other um, sort of broad issue is, is that um, a better building or a healthier community, one that you feel, okay, well, this building is going to be solid or it's going to be protected by a wall, has present day consequences, right? So if all of a sudden you're spending a half a million dollars on upgrading your building, guess what? All the folks paying $400 rent are getting evicted so that new people who can afford $800 rents in a safe, clean, and uh, new building, right, are, are taken care of. These are the complexities, right, of just, and I'm just mentioning a few of what's, what's at hand here. You clearly are working with, you know, you know, friends at the city with, you know, I, I love all the, all the logos that you're working with, but is the complexity of this decision making um, taken into account as you present, or is it oh, something yes. that you present the science and then they make the decision? How, do, how does this work? No, I, th I think that this is, a, you point at something which is very interesting and very challenging, is that complexity. I mean, if you ask me, build me a structure, I can make you something which is going to be impenetrable. Like I can make thick walls, a nice, lovely bunker, nothing <laughs> goes in, but nobody would like to live in. That's one component. The other component there, uh, so, I mean, and That's there true. is the discussion with the architects and how you implement certain solutions. The other component there, which is very challenging, is with new structures, okay, with existing structures, what do we do? And, and a structure is not the structure in Ireland, but you have to take into account within the infrastructure that is there, within the community, so the, uh, the urban, let's say, integration that you have. Now, affordable housing is really a challenging problem because, first of all, okay, you have some kind of uh, funding that might come, but if you have natural affordable housing and something happens or you try to adapt, exactly, you lose the affordability. So it's not going to, it's a very challenging idea of, okay, well, we want to implement some adaptation measures, but how do we do it? Do we scale up? Some of the, uh, some of those measures are not allowed actually. So wet proofing, if you have a residential, uh, a residential uh, structure, it's not allowed. Why? Because the water will go in so this becomes in a habitable space. So, you know, I'm assuming there's similar applications with ecosystems. I mean, just uh, I remember when they, uh, and of course it kills all our coral reefs, but when they were trying to dredge uh, the port of Miami so that the big ships from the Panama, can, that would kind of go across the new Panama Canal could, could come into our port, everyone promised up and down because they were trying to, just like the pandemic, it's about, you know, opening schools and opening businesses because we need the money. Uh, everyone promised up and down that the corals would be okay. Clearly what happened, all the salt that was deposited, we just uh, destroyed a whole bunch of ecosystems and habitats and the seagrasses and the corals. Would, would, would there be unintended consequences, you know, in, in trying to create some, um, you know, some valuable, like the idea of let's not have a storm surge come and, and kill people, right, in, in the coastal areas, but are there unintended consequences of uh, causing the kind of environmental degradation that kills an economy because of an algal bloom that happens during the construction? Those are also issues to consider, right? Of course, and these are things we don't know, and I don't think there is a way to model those things because the, our models are basically, an approximation of something that happens based on inputs that we have. And we run those simulations, we run our models, and we get some outputs out that we analyze. So these are not tailored to take into account all parameters. That's one thing that we clearly identify. So each model has a purpose, assumptions there, and we cannot use our models for everything. Right. They cannot predict the future. That's what I'm trying to say. Now, yeah. on the other side, a very interesting uh, you mentioned something regarding the ecosystems. And I think that the ecosystems as infrastructure, we do not have the right attitude or approach towards them. So when we did this um, with our uh, Coral Reef project, we did a workshop and we invited different, uh, let's say, stakeholders. There was some people that came and we were talking about how the Coral Reefs help. And we were clearly asked by how much and how many do I need? 
because I will have to report back to my residents and I will have to tell them that we invest X amount of money to get that protection. And this is not, I mean, it's not a clear answer there because that will depend on what is the, uh, the storm level and what is the surge level, what is the wind direction. So all our approach there, we have, we have learned, and I'm an engineer and I can tell you that this bothers me. We've learned to operate in a very well-defined environment. Our answers are based, I mean, I don't want to say homework type problems, but this is, we operate in a world where we have no, uh, let's say, previous uh, examples, or if we have, they're way back, and it's kind of like words of wisdom, but we don't need to really think of them. Yeah, that mortality you see off the, off, uh, off um, you know, uh, South Beach, uh, closer to the port, there's a factor that we can't measure now because it's coming through time and that is uh, warming oceans. And there's a point where that mortality is gonna be across any, any, any area up and down, right? There's a point where the biological issues <laughs> you know, take effect. So, I mean, again, all, um, all I'm trying to do is just, uh, we, you know, you as scientists are here to simplify things so you can understand them and analyze them. And I, what I try to do is also explain, yeah, but there's an incredible amount of complexity. And I think the last thing I want to sort of comment on is this, is that clearly we need to figure out ways of adapting and we need to find new ways of thinking and new materials and all that. So I, I celebrate and applaud what you do. It's good to put a face to all the, uh, all the models that I kept on seeing at Brian's um, lab mm -hmm. while I was doing my hurricane paintings there with him. So thank you for, for all your hard work. Thank you. But one of the- yeah, I want to mention real quick, David, that those uh, sea highs, I don't often mention it, but they're certainly anticipate could be a place where you could plant mangroves in because of, because of the perforations. And that, that's part of the design is to be something that you can incorporate, whether it's um, oysters or seagrasses or sea or mangroves or something like that for a living shoreline, much better than a riprap or, a, of course, a straight seawall. That's awesome. Yeah, sort of like uh, hybrid ecosystem services, which obviously makes all the sense. I think the last thing I just wanted to say, and I know I'm, I'm asking a lot of questions. If anyone puts their hands up, I'll, I'll be quiet, but this is the last one. And that is also just about, um, about managing expectations, right, for our city and for our community. And, um, and you know, and, and by the way, I'm really impressed with the visualizations that you created. I'm going to be calling you because I, I want to use those to, to work on some of the research. I'm doing with my research team, right? Sure. The team of us that do it. And that is to try to visualize what a future of a, of a Miami uh, with rising seas looks like and look at specific neighborhoods and which neighborhoods will probably need to be abandoned. Like managing expectations that there is a point where it just doesn't make any financial sense because they're just at low enough elevations or not enough density or tax base to protect them. So it's an important consideration, but one that I think um, with humility for us to also understand too that as much as we care about and want to you know stop the boats from sinking at some time there's a point where you need to abandon ship and sometimes it's important to to be truthful to that so that not all your resources are spent on fixing a hole and some resources are made for life jackets and i think that miami has an incredible blind spot for the fact that migration is an option that there there is a time when we are going to have to move uh, and if if all we do is plan for building up and fixing it when all of and i'm not talking about next week you know i'm just talking no, about I, I, uh, I i think that we do so at our peril and that's what really bothers me about the back bay study that so much of it is aspirational about an about a storm event not even about gradual sea level rise and it puts all this money and resources and attention on an eventuality, but one that doesn't even begin to address the broader impacts of how you move 3 million people. Um, and, I, and, I, and just that's where I think, Paul, talking about complexities, I think that's the big elephant that uh, when we're putting these plans, it's not just about what the, land, what the, whole, what the builder or slumlord or, or mayor or present day Miamians wanna do, but how do we plan in an integrated way and just like this pandemic, how do we do that in concert with everything that's gonna uh, unfurl across our entire peninsular coastline, our entire Atlantic seaboard, 
and across the halls of Congress. And let's not even talk about the Caribbean Basin and the world economy, because all of this will happen at the same time. So don't want to be a naysayer, but I just, I just, I just want to unpackage sort of what feel like good solutions that we need. We need science and we need to advance it, but it has to be in the context of, of that reality too. I have to give you something that I tried some time ago. So I've been working in a project and I, I work with an expert basically on uh, relocation. She's a social scientist and she is an expert in climate relocation. So we discuss those issues and it's kind of like a taboo issue, especially in Miami, in Miami Beach. So uh, we were in a workshop and we were doing these charades about climate. And I said like, uh, excuse me, but you're projecting. So I, I was playing the role of the civil uh, engineer. So they were talking to me about infrastructure and they asked me a couple of questions. And I was like, okay, I have a question for you though. Do you project that the same, I mean, the same growth in population will happen if those conditions occur? Why do you need more? I mean, why should you expand the roads? I mean, I don't think the people will stay. And they were like, no, we, we have the models and we will continue linear growth. And I was like, I'm not sure this is totally correct. So this because is what I'm all, saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's all we know how to do. An, an economy without growth collapses. A tax base without growth collapses. So that's the only way to survive in, in the present day mentality. Yes, but on the other hand, talking with some uh, friends and and uh, who happen to be in real estate, they told me that developers actually have models that take that into account. So this is kind of like the other side, the dark side, where the developer actually knows when the investment is not going to pay off. Of course, it's, it's the return on investment because they have a different timeline. Your timeline is you build a condo in two years, you sell it to someone who's going to flip it in five, you get your two in two years, you get your ROI. The guy who's going to flip it gets it in five, and we're gaming it. And in and while all these, you know, cranes, the bird of Miami, you know, the building crane, is um, is happy and all over our coastline, there's a bunch of residents who are a bunch of suckers who are going to who are going to get really screwed because they think everyone's in the same timeline. Yeah. Right. No, so that's kind of that's the problem we're having, right? And that's what I meant to say. It's it's really yeah. really complex, and and and. Um, kicking the can down the road, problem solving in a myopic way. Um, you know, it, it, I mean, we need pilot sites, we need that. But what I think the reason I, I want and love this group is because we're, we're here to look at it from another vantage point. Like a lot of people here care about their homes uh, and when we started the group, but what they really cared was about their grandchildren who were gonna inherit that home, right? I mean, that's really what the, the whole, that's why it's called underwater HOA. We're not underwater now, but the, the, the home, this home at six feet, hold on, at six feet, will eventually um, be underwater. That's, that's it. That's indisputable, right? So how do we plan for what happens to, to this house that I sit in right now? So that's a, that's a question. Anyway, I, I'm sorry for hogging up so much time. I was just so, um, so grateful for you to share with us what a relevant, it's relevant a pleasure. conversation. Brian, thank you so much for, you know, for bringing him to, to our underwater HOA. Uh, thanks. Does anybody have any other question before we move on and give uh, Landolf get a drink of water or something or whatever he needs to do? <laughs> okay, so there was a good segue in there about the uh, myopic uh, thinking and, and I guess trying to have a single view about stuff and a narrow view and that's to talk about the back bay plan. Um, I, let's see, could you maybe, I just have the from, I'm not going to read the document or like re go through it in a little in real detail. But what I was going to do is just introduce uh, to you. We heard about the the plan last week, which is the Corps of Engineers plan for how to deal with storm surge in Miami um, and how to protect. It was called the Miami Dade Back Bay Plan to protect Miami Dade from a storm surge event, and. Um, they did a pretty good analysis of what a, a bad case storm, a worst case storm would be in a, in, a, in a setting of sea level rise. They actually used a, a fairly aggressive sea level rise model. So you can't fault them on doing this, but um, in the way they did that. And then as Landolf mentioned, they did this social vulnerability analysis and things like that. Um, but I, but it, there's a lot of major gaps and a lot of issues in this study. And um, can you let me share my screen there, uh, 
or am I available to do that? Okay. Yeah, you should be good to go. Yeah, okay. And this is, um, so the core has, is now the plan has been put out and it includes, and, and uh, we, we have some links you can go to see what it is, but it includes basically some projects in, as we heard about last week, large seawall projects down along uh, Brickell and protecting downtown, 20 foot high permanent seawalls installed in the water just off of the coastal property. So basically between the intercoastal waterway and the shoreline, there'd be a giant 20 foot high wall installed there along that, along Brickell through Bayfront and all that. And also see um, storm surge barriers on the Miami River and Little Arch Creek and a significant other walls around there to protect essentially the area north of uh, the Rickenbacker Causeway. The South Dade was not really included in the plan at all, which is the whole separate issue. But in this, and, and, because, and the main reason was that in terms of the number of people, the value of the property with some adjustment for social vulnerability, it was decided that this, the core decided that this, that that area was what should be protected with engineering solutions. And the, and this Xavier alluded to this, and it's, it's a huge issue with the plan is the, the Corps had about a year to do their plan. So they had, they got $3 million to come in, parachute in from the Jacksonville office is the one that did this. And uh, to do this plan, or actually it's Norfolk, even I think, but anyway, to come to Florida, figure out what they're going to do, and design our future for the next 20 years, and going forward. But this is the plan that the federal government, you know, they're proposing this three million dollar study is the lead into a billion dollar, multi billion dollar project, protect Miami Dade and, and sea level and storm surge. Not considering sea level rise, not considering day to day flooding, but just from storm surge going forward. And they had a very narrow scope and they were, did not consider how the whole system would work together. It was kind of looking at their this analysis and where they could prevent flooding, excuse me. And the, uh, so they, um, so this, this, this narrow scope with a very, um, and they told me that you know that we're not going to we we can't consider water quality we can't consider ecosystems we can't consider all this. They said in the in the preamble to this report they're not going to do any kind of nature based solutions. They're only going to look at engineered solutions that solve this very narrow problem, which is storm surge. And this is the plan that would be our future for decades in in Miami Dade County. And so what the a group at Clio uh, and uh, Miami Waterkeepers led an effort to get it, develop a community organization-based response to this plan, and that's what this this um, this letter that was sent to the Miami-Dade Commission was signed on to by a large number of community-based organizations to say, and the fundamental tack that they took in the letter was that, which which um, is we. Do, this was sent on July 20th, so between the two meetings, Xavier and I discussed this, and we you know, talked with other people about this, and, and I, I was actually in, involved in the, the discussions that created the letter, that we would sign on as an organization to this letter. And the main reason is to lend all this weight towards the idea that instead of this core-based solution, the legislation that enacted the study allowed there to be a community-based alternative to the core solution for Miami-Dade County. So this is all goes into the legislation that creates this and might provide the funding to do this. And what the, the community organizations have signed on to is this letter, which we'll send a link around for to everybody that says, you know, that we believe for the reasons outlined, which is that you know, it hasn't considered the community impacts. It hasn't considered the alternatives to extreme engineering solutions. It doesn't consider sea level rise. It's a very complex problem that we could spend 
who needs a lot more community-based input to, that rather than just comments to a plan that got dropped on us in a month. And to develop a comprehensive plan for Miami-Dade's future under sea level rise and storm potential for storm surge impacts. And that, the, that instead of adopting the core plan for funding, that there should be a, a community-based alternative should be considered. So that's the basic idea. So the letter was, yeah, Mando. Yeah, I wanna, I, I wanna add that, that basically the Miami-Dade County is, uh, uh, I think they're looking on our support in twisting that plan. Because I was talking with uh, the resilience office and basically they're hoping that they will be able to do that. So I think that they know that there are fundamental issues with that. And I have, a, I mean, they, they gave me an example which really terrifies me. And you mentioned water quality. The water treatment facilities, we don't have many. There's one which is next to the American Airlines Arena, I think. I mean, not far from there. And they said that this was not uh, taken, uh, uh, I mean, this was not protected because it's not a high value property because they go per, per property value. They don't go with respect to the service that is provided. Just to give you an, uh, uh, I mean, uh, an anchor there, but the, the, the county is looking I mean, they were looking for our support. So then, the, you know, there's so many levels. The problem is, as Xavier talked about there with, you know, once this plan is out and it's, if it were to be implemented, then you would have a, essentially a plan that says, we're gonna do this construction here and protect these properties, which are presently some of the lower income uh, North Miami neighborhoods would be protected, but how long, will they remain <laughs> uh, affordable communities if those are the ones that the federal government says they're gonna invest $4 billion in protecting for the future and, and you know the, everybody on the other side of the wall or south of the causeway and all that. It's, it's a very complex problem in terms of how you just focus on that, that issue. Uh, Jamal, go ahead. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't mean to be driving the conversation just speak up. I think you're raising your hand or no? Oh, I thought you were raising your oh, hand. Oh, no. No, 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 no. I'm just, <laughs> sorry. My head, my head just in my, sorry. So just in short, I mean, there's not so many people on the call anymore. The, the, the open comments period for individuals is still open. So I encourage you to go and put your two cents worth in to, to this. The more letters, the more support. But the fundamental thing that the, I mean, nobody wants to say, we're not going to think about these things. We don't need them. You know, we're just going to keep the status quo. And we don't want a plan. I think that's this is that that'd be the worst thing to do, right? But what the I think the the organizations have drafted a very responsible um, response to this, which is that we understand that there's a lot of constraints on how the core had to do this. We don't think that they've fully considered all the alternatives that are appropriate and all the complexity of working in Miami-Dade County in their one year of work on this, that we need a community-based solution. We, we're not saying we don't have severe sea level rise problems that require um, solutions that we may not be willing to consider, right? We, we don't think are necessarily in the public um, arena right now, but that doesn't mean that we want to go this route and right away without considering fully the different, the whole full complexity of the problem and alternatives to large engineering solutions, which is the only thing the core really knows how to do. And they're the ones that did the plan. <laughs> so, so anyway, so I, that's the main thing is that we'll send around, Adam can send around links or if, if they're not there to the letter and to the, the plan where it's open for public comments. Yeah, thanks, Brian. We, uh, we just, Adam put the link right there on, uh, the link to this document, which was sent to community leaders and partners to sign. You and I uh, both signed this letter on, on behalf of the underwater HOA, as we had told our last meeting that we were gonna do. And then I know that on the website, Adam has a link, uh, and also in the newsletter, everyone got a link to the, to the actual uh, back bay study. So thanks a lot for leading us with that. I think what I want to, uh, what we want to do now, right, is, is turn this over to Adam so he can instruct us on the next steps. Adam? 
Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Maybe um, you can sharing the screen for a second, uh, uh, Brian. Oh, uh, stop sharing. There we go. Great. Um, so yeah, so I mean, there's about 10 of us in here now. It's already kind of an intimate group, but I would like to just break us out into a kind of an introductory session um, for the engagement and outreach group and then for the Pinecrest Underwater HOA. Um, I have everybody set to go into a breakout session um, as to what you selected beforehand. If you don't wanna join, you don't have to, or you can leave <laughs> like that. Um, what I would like to do before we break out is hand it over to Jamal just to announce next month's speaker. Um, and then once he does that, then I'll break us into our uh, breakout sessions for just like 10 minutes or so. It's, I don't think it needs to be anything long. It's already 8-12. We'll uh, you know, talk a little bit about what those groups are meant to do, and we'll just leave from there. Um, so with that, I'd like to hand it over to Jamal. Uh, so thank you all for, for attending. Uh, Dr. Rod Barbrigos, much appreciated. Your presentation was amazing. And so join us on September 2nd, uh, the next first Wednesday of the month for Dr. Hunter Vaughn's presentation of environmental impacts and resource dependency of digital online culture. Uh, Dr. Vaughn is a visiting lecturer with the University of Miami's ABES Center for Ecosystem Science and Policy, teaching issues on media and the environment. Um, he's, his research focuses on um, the relationship between media ethics and social power and the environment. Yep. Thank you, Jamal. Yeah, um, he was one of my main professors during my master's program uh, at UM, which is the same program that Jamal is in. So uh, we have uh, much respect for, for Dr. Vaughn, and we look forward to having him, uh, you know, be with us next, next month. So with that, I'm going to go ahead um, and say thanks to everyone. I'm going to end this main call, and we're going to break out into our breakout rooms. And then whenever those end, we're not going to reconvene. We'll just go from there. Um, so for anybody who we're not going to see later, Bye. And uh, we're going to open these rooms. Thank you. Bye.